In this episode, special guest Judd Brewer, pioneering psychiatrist, neuroscientist, and New York Times best-selling author, joins the ongoing conversation featuring Shinzen Young, meditation teacher and neuroscience research consultant, Chelsea Fasano, a Columbia University neuroscience student, and Dr. Jay Sanguinetti, assistant director for the Center for Consciousness Studies and research professor at the University of New Mexico. In this episode, Dr. Brewer gives a fascinating summary of his groundbreaking work and shares his wildest secret dream for the future of neuroscience and humanity at large. Dr. Sanguinetti and Shinzen reveal the latest science from their lab and dialogue with Dr. Brewer about pseudo-arhats and the power of conditioning. The panel also map the four noble truths using the latest neuroscience theories, debate the pros and cons of including subjective experience in serious research, explore how to translate academic language into common parlance, and raise serious concerns about the healthy integration of altered states. So without further ado, Shinzen Young, Chelsea Fasano, Dr. Jay Sanguinetti, and special guest Dr. Judd Brewer. Shinzen Young, Chelsea Fasano, and Dr. Jay Sanguinetti, and very special guest, Dr. Judd Brewer. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. Good to be here. Very excited for this show. Well, I'm so delighted to have you here, Dr. Brewer, and I know the others uh, feel the same way. And your pioneering work and contributions to the fields of psychiatry and neuroscience continue to be incredibly significant. So it's, it's such a pleasure to have you joining us today. And actually, to begin with, in terms of structure, uh, Dr. Brewer has agreed to share with us a summary of his work on the default mode network, and also uh, give us an update from the front lines of um, where that work is now in terms of its, its leading edge research. And then after that, uh, Dr. Sanguinetti will talk to us about the ultrasound neuromodulation work he and Shinzen have been carrying out at Semilab uh, in Arizona. And from there, many avenues of discussion I think we can pursue. So I won't say any more. I won't use another minute on introduction. Uh, Dr. Brewer, could you please start us off? Sure. And because we've published a bunch of papers on this over the past couple of years, I thought maybe I would just kind of give it in a, a narrative form as compared to saying, you know, here's the abstract, here's the abstract, here's the abstract. And folks can certainly re read the papers if they want to get into the nitty gritty details. But to me, the temporal sequence is more interesting and helpful to understand in terms of how we kind of went about this. And I think it, it kind of starts with a, you know, a joke. What, what's the difference between a fairy tale and a war story? You know, fairy tale starts once upon a time and a war story starts, no shit, there I was. So, <laughs> so no shit, there I was. I, it was back in probably 2008. I just started my assistant professorship at Yale, and I had this wonderful career mentor, Mark Potenza, who, innocently enough, you know, we were talking about, you know, I was interested in studying meditators, and and he said, well, why don't you study some experienced meditators? And I was thinking, ah, oh, no, you know, that stuff's already. I'm sure that's already been done. And he, but he put kind of put a bug in my ear to look to see what had been done. You know, there was some very early work by Antoine Lutz who'd published some of, some of the first neuroimaging results that I know of back in 2004. Uh, this is with Tibetan meditators, et cetera. But it really, uh, th this question that had come up for me was like, what's common amongst different types of meditation practices, you know, in terms of brain activity? And that that the answer to that question hadn't really been answered. So. It took us several years, but we collected several. Uh, we collected uh, data from a number of medit experienced meditators with the with the very basic question of like what's similar between three different types of common meditation practices, right? So concentration meditation, where where we just use breath awareness as that object of of focus. Uh, we use loving kindness meditation, uh, and then the third was choiceless awareness. Uh, which, which I'm sure has been described before, but basically people being aware of whatever's in their sensory experience in that moment. So whether whatever the senses are, you know, seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, you know, smelling, et cetera. And we, so we collected data uh, where we looked at these meditators and we collected it in a way where we could look at both activity and connectivity. Uh, so we had long enough blocks of these fMRI studies where you know, for functional connectivity, you need a certain period of time where somebody's doing the same thing. It's not just like moment to moment. 
Uh, and then you can look at both activity and functional connectivity. And when we looked at our data, we first, uh, you know, the, the person that was analyzing the data said, you know, Judd, um, you know, we're not really finding anything. And that, um, you know, we, because we were looking to see if there were increases in activity in, in the brain with experience versus novice meditators, you know, because when I was back then, when I was meditating, I felt like I was working hard, you know, so I figured I, you know, there had to be something that was increasing in activity in the brain. And uh, the, the person that was doing the analysis, her name was Hetty Kober. She said, you know, we're not finding anything. And so I said, well, what if we look at the opposite way? What if we look to see if there are decreases in activity uh, in experienced meditators? And that's where something really interesting popped, where we found when we looked across the entire brain, there were only four brain regions that were different in activity. This is, again, when we looked when we brought um, these three different types of meditations together and we're looking for common activation or deactivation patterns, we found that two of the four brain regions that were different between experienced and novice meditators were the two hubs of the default mode network, the medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex. And that at first threw us for a loop, but then started to make sense. The more, so I had to quickly learn what the default mode network was and then you know, see how this fit with the theory. So the default mode network, I'm sure, has been ex discussed extensively here. So I won't go into all the details. But the way that we're, you know, we were thinking about it this time is that this is a self-referential brain network, and so it, it gets activated when people are daydreaming, when they're caught up in cravings, when they're ruminating, when they're caught up in anxious worry about the future. And so that started to make sense when we thought about it in terms of this common denominator of getting caught up in our experience. So when people start, were getting caught up in their experience, this was our working hypothesis, when they were caught up in a craving, when they were caught up in worry, for example, they were activating the default one network. And when they were meditating, meditation is about letting go, not getting caught up in our experience. So that was the working hypothesis that that first cross-sectional study suggested to us. And so, you know, it's, we, it gave us a whole avenue of exploration which we then took farther by doing neurophenomenologic experiments. And by this, I had a colleague at Yale, Xenius Papademetrist, he and uh, his graduate student at the time, Dustin Shinos, had developed a real-time neurofeedback apparatus where we could actually give people feedback from their own brains in real time in the fMRI scanner. So they had worked it out so they could, you know, all the, all the math, all the functional activity analysis could be done really quickly in, in less than half a second. And with those studies, we could then start to, I won't go into all the details, but we could do a bunch of blinded experiments where we could, we could test novice and experienced meditators to see if that hypothesis that getting caught up in our experience is correlated with, with increased activity and, and not getting caught up was correlated with decreased activity. We could test that through these neurophenomenologic experiments where we could link subjective experience with brain activity. Basically, you know, people could be watching their own brain activity virtually in real time. There's a slight lag with the with the hemodynamic response function in the in the brain, as as interpreted by bold signal. But basically, with a little lag in mind, they could look to see if the graphs you know that we were showing them while they were while they're meditating um, were lining up with their direct experience. And there we found uh, we published a number of papers on this. We found that, yes, indeed, it was true. This getting caught up in our experience, you know, being identified with our experience was correlating with increased activity and uh, letting go was correlating with decreased activity. And those experiments actually gave us probably some of the most interesting insights in terms of linking up direct subjective experience where, you know, there were people saying, oh, you know, I had some thoughts come up, but they, you know, they did the, it, my brain activity was still decreased. It was blue. Blue was indicating decreased activity. And they were, they were linking up, oh, it's not just having thoughts. It's about getting caught up in the thoughts it themselves. Cause this was a blinded experiment. They didn't even know, you know, which way was up or down. They were just supposed to correlate this with their experience. And so it was giving us some really nice insight into the nuance here around, you know, it's not just about experience having thoughts. It's about I, being identified with thoughts, which then linked up, started to link up with my own clinical experience of, you know, my patients. It's not just about them having anxious thoughts. It's about worrying or getting caught up in, you know, that storyline 
of the anxious thoughts. Thoughts themselves aren't a problem. Same for emotions, same for body sensations. So it, at, at that level, in terms of the functional activity, we were, we were able to start to get a sense for what in particular the posterior cingulate cortex was doing because we were only giving people feedback from one brain region at the time. The reason we focused on the posterior cingulate was that that was the one that had the largest changes in signal. And we could also show that experienced meditators could voluntarily decrease their posterior cingulate activity compared to novice meditators. And also, as we started looking at this, conceptually, the posterior cingulate seemed to line up more with this experiential sense of self is the way we were looking at this. You know, the medial prefrontal cortex seems to be based on its uh, anatomical and functional connectivity seems to be more of a marker of a, a conceptual sense of self. This is uh, building on uh, Georg Northoff's work uh, with Chin and others, where you know they're suggesting these two hubs of the FOMO network have maybe slightly different functions. So the conceptual sense of self, like having a thought, like I am Judd, uh, is maybe more correlated with the medial prefrontal cortex, whereas the experience of you know somebody's like, hey Judd, you know I'm like, oh that's me. You know, that seems to, at least that's our working hypothesis, that seemed to be more correlated with the posterior cingulate cortex. And the experiential sense of self from a, from a practical standpoint, from a training standpoint, and even from a Buddhist perspective, was the place where we wanted to explore more anyway, because, you know, it's about getting caught up in our experience. It's about identification that seems to be where the root of suffering is. Of course, Shinzen, you know, if you're biting your tongue, jump in and correct me at any point. Um, but that's, that seems to be where a lot of that was lining up. I'll just mention one other thing, and then Jay can jump in. I'll mention two other things. So in, that, in the first cross-sectional study, we could also look at functional connectivity. So when we uh, planted a seed in the posterior cingulate, meaning where we asked the question, what brain regions are co-activated with the posterior cingulate cortex, which are you know, functionally con connected, basically, you know, which ones are basically talking to each other? we found a very different pattern in experience versus novice meditators. So during meditation, we found that the posterior cingulate was more connected with the dorsal anterior cingulate, which is some describe this as like a self-monitoring part, uh, part of an executive network, and also more connected uh, with the, with the uh, actually at baseline, it was more connected with both the dorsal anterior cingulate, but also the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. During, um, during meditation, those differences were less pronounced. And it suggested that uh, experienced meditators, their functional connectivity was changed regardless of whether they were meditating or whether they weren't meditating. Whereas with novice meditators, they seem to be able to ramp up that connectivity a little bit during meditation, whereas experienced meditators were already there. Now, this also lined up with previous work well, it lined up with future work because it subsequently, a couple of years later, groups were publishing that, you know, if you looked at the functional connectivity between the dorsal anterior cingulate and the posterior cingulate, for example, if the dorsal anterior cingulate using grazer ca ca causality models, if it was kind of inhibiting, and it's not really accurate, but it's from a heuristic perspective, if the dorsal anterior cingulate was dominating, let's say, and the posterior cingulate was quiet, uh, people did better on cognitive tasks, whereas if the dorsal anterior, if the if the posterior cingulate cortex was active and the dorsal anterior cingulate was quiet, and they were saying, you know, it was kind of having dominion over the over the dorsal anterior cingulate, that's when people did worse at at uh, cognitive tasks, suggesting that, you know, the posterior cingulate, when we're caught up in our experience, we get in our own way and we we aren't able to function as as effortlessly, which you know, which makes sense. Um, there are studies showing that people in flow, which I think of as optimal, you know, performance experience, their, their posterior cingulate is quiet um, during those times. So all of these studies started to line up suggesting that not only with activity, you know, decreases during meditation, that lined up with people not getting caught up in their experience, but also when their posterior cingulate was quiet, especially in novice, inexperienced meditators, inexperienced meditators, their connectivity was different regardless of whether they were meditating or not. And this, you know, this may, it's, it's hard to draw direct causal, you know, uh, conclusions from that. But so for me, I just kind of hold that loosely 
as saying, yeah, they're, well, their connectivity is different and their, their, their activity certainly is different and it, based on different tasks. The last thing I'll mention is, you know, more recently, we wanted to look at the functional and the uh, pragmatic outcomes of changes in, in the activity in the default mode network. You know, I had a, a career mentor, uh, Bruce Roundsville, who used to ask me this question, so what? You know, it's like, okay, you know, you're studying all this stuff and experienced meditators, so what? So as a, as a psychiatrist, it's, you know, I, I also want to ask that question because I want to make sure that things that we're finding neuroscientifically are actually have pragmatic clinical value. And so we did a randomized control trial uh, where we brought in people that wanted to quit smoking and we scanned, and this is in collaboration with Amy Janes at Harvard, who had developed this really nice smoking Q reactivity paradigm where you could show people pictures of cigarettes and if they, you know, it, it could activate their default mode network if they're, if they're if, particularly if they're addicted to cigarettes. So we could, we could bring people in at baseline, scan, you know, show them this Q reactivity paradigm, measure the amount of posterior cingulate activity they had, and then we could randomize them to get an app-based mindfulness training program. In this case, we had developed this program called Craving to Quit, or they could also be randomized to get the National Cancer Institute's Quit Guide, which is more of a cognitive-based therapy. And then we could scan them a month later to see if changes in brain activity predicted clinical outcomes. Long story short there was, uh, we found that the, uh, mindful, the mindfulness training group in particular, there were no correlations in the control group, but the mindfulness training group showed correlations between reductions in posterior cingulate activity and reductions in cigarette smoking. So you can, you, and that basically correlated um, significantly where there was, you know, the more they reduced activity after a month of mindfulness training, the, the more they had reduced the number of cigarettes they'd smoked. And we also found that the more, the number of modules they completed, the more they completed, the better they did. So there was kind of a dose, just dose, uh, dose response curve basically the more the more of a dose of mindfulness training they got as marked by the modules they completed the better they did and in fact when we just took those two variables together with the baseline number of cigarettes they'd smoked we could account for about i think it was 58 percent of the variance so a huge amount of the uh, effect that we found in reduction in cigarette smoking was accounted for you know based on well how many cigarettes they'd started smoking at you know at baseline so the the more cigarettes they smoked, the better they did, which makes a lot of sense. But also more modules they completed, the better they did, which makes sense. And then also the more their brain activity reduced they, the, in the posterior cingulate, the better they did. Suggesting that we could see, you know, if they get mindfulness training, they, we can directly target the default mode network. And if we can directly target the default mode network, we can see real effects in clinical outcomes like reductions in cigarettes. So that's... That's kind of the arc, you know, that we'd gone through. That was about, you know, eight years from the first paper to the to the most recent paper that we published on it, um, which was in 2019, starting with, you know, hey, what's going on in the brain with experienced meditators? Oh, default mode network activity and connectivity differences. You know, let's do a bunch of neurophenomenologic work to make sure that we're really lining up their subjective experience with their brain activity. And then let's take this to the clinical utility of the translational neuroscience to see if this actually correlates with clinical outcomes. So I know that was a lot of information, but I will pause there and um, in maybe Jay can take over from here with. I, actually, Jay, Jay oh. before mm -hmm. Jay speaks, I, I want to interrupt sure. because although that was a lot of information, We've got a lot of information for you oh, that's please. really, really relevant. And I guess I would just before turning it over to Jay, ask you to give one more presentation. Um, you took it to translational showing in a amazing way, a training effect. Uh, a clinical effect from mindfulness training. Uh, that's a beginning of translation. I know you worked with neurofeedback and you and I had discussions about direct stimulation versus neurofeedback back in the day. Um, can you give us just some sense of where you're seeing 
your next step or, or the field's next step in translational and maybe even a next step, just really briefly, because that'll contextual, that'll give us a way to think at scale, how to tell about how our stuff intersects with your groundbreaking work. Yeah. I'd be happy to, Shinzen. And yeah, I think this will lead directly into uh, what I, I'm very curious to hear what you all are up to. So when we had done these early neurophenomenologic studies, you know, I think we'd published these, you know, around 2013, 2014, uh, the graduate student, Dustin Shinos at the time had said, hey, you know, have you thought about doing EEG neurofeedback with these folks? And there, you know, there are certainly trade-offs between fMRI and EEG. EEG is much better temporally, you know, in terms of giving immediate feedback where there's the delay with fMRI. But fMRI was much better spatially, where we knew if we were giving feedback, we we're pretty confident we knew what brain regions we were giving feedback from. Yet we started to uh, translate the fMRI findings, because as you're pointing out, Shenzhen, from a clinical scale perspective, it, fMRI's neurofeedback is really just not scalable. It's great <laughs> for proof of concept, but there aren't yeah. portable fMRI scanners that, you know, that don't not, need liquid yet. helium <laughs> yet, yet. So down, down the road, and I know people are working on these, but I don't know when these will be available, you know, if it's 10 years, if it's 20 years, who knows? When there, when there are good, you know, room temperature, you know, fMRI <laughs> scanners that are portable, then I think that'll be a really nice uh, way to apply these things where we know exactly where we're giving people feedback from. But in the meantime, you know, none of us are, uh, well, I'll just speak for myself. I'm not patient enough to wait that 20 years for the if and when. So we started working with EEG neurofeedback where we could give source estimated neurofeedback which uh, source estimated neurofeedback basically is, is you know, where we can use what's called beamformers to give people feedback from basically from the same regions uh, as we could with fMRI. And I say uh, with a little hesitation there, because again, the beamformers there, it's a, a lot of math goes into that. And it's, it's just not the same as seeing a very clear picture from an anatomical scan in the fMRI scanner. So this is, you know, we, we take these data with a, a little bit more of a grain of salt in terms of what we're giving feedback from. However, I can say that we did, we were able to do double blind randomized controlled trials with the EEG neurofeedback and basically replicate what we did with the fMRI neurofeedback. So, you know, give us good, pretty good confidence that with an $80,000, you know, EEG neurofeedback device and very skilled, you know, PhD level postdocs who could administer the feedback you know, we could, we could give feedback. And I say all of that, you know, the, the money and the skill, because again, that's also not scalable, but Shinzen uh, was very, very kind and generous in donating his brain uh, to come down and try some of that neurofeedback out. So we could get a sense for where that was, how well it lined up, for example, with subjective experience, not only his, but with other folks as well. And we could start to get a sense for what it would look like to, you know, if somebody had a neurofeedback training apparatus, you know, what would that need to look like? What are some of the minimum requirements? And for me, you know, certainly there's EEG neurofeedback has been around for a long time. You can use a single electrode and stick it on, you know, the vertex of somebody's head and you can give them feedback, you know, great. And people do that in, in neurofeedback clinics where they train people based on these large data sets, et cetera. That's not what we're doing. <clears throat> I don't want to train people based on normalized data sets. I want to train people to help <laughs> help them awaken. And we don't have a, awakened data sets yet um, at a large at a large scale. So the way I was thinking about this, and still am to some degree, is that EEG neurofeedback is a great if we can get it <clears throat> uh, accurate and scalable. So right now, you know, we've we've gotten it down from 128 leads to 32 leads with you know about 90 percent of of the same signal, so it's good enough. It's a little noisier, but it's it's good enough. Um, and we are we're at the place where we just need to have a customized headset, basically, where we could, you know, we can cut the cost down from eighty thousand to ten thousand. It still needs a, a you know a skilled clinician or a EEG neurofeedback um, 
uh, technician to be able to administer it. So it would still be in a clinic as compared to, you know, somebody orders this online and then they watch a video of how to put the cap on their head and they go from there. That I think is down, that is coming. Uh, but that again is, is years down the road. But with the EG, you know, I, one thing that I see that's useful there, and I think this will be interesting to see how you all would combine that with ultrasound because these two are absolutely uh, able to be paired. The way I think of this is, and Shinzen, you've been you've been teaching people by giving them feedback for decades, right? As a as a very effective means, and this has been done for thousands of years. You know, a meditator reports on their experience to the teacher. The teacher interprets that, that gives them feedback, and then the person interprets their feedback, and then goes home and practices with some tweaks. So the EEG neuro or some type of accurate neurofeedback, it could be EEG or otherwise, can give can help um, reduce the level of misinterpretation. So if somebody misinterprets their own direct experience, as in, well, they hadn't, they had some experience, it's, it's ineffable, it's hard for them to describe it. They try to describe it to a teacher, a teacher tries to interpret it. And this is where the skilled teachers have enough experience, they can be, oh, is it kind of like this? And they can help them walk language into their experience. Um, they're still room for misinterpretation because all of that is based on interpretation with, with two people. You can kind of avoid, you can augment that by bringing in a uh, feedback that's directly from somebody's own brain, as long as it's calibrated correctly. And so, so there we could see, you know, a teacher working with a student where the student's getting feedback from the, you know, from the device that could be saying, oh, you know, go in this direction. Yeah, that's good. And then they could be describing their experience to their teacher and their teacher could say, help them interpret and conceptualize it. And that way, you know, they can learn to reproduce the experience itself. I mean, this is, this is the epitome of, of deep absorptive meditation practices. It's not just that you got into a state, it's that you know exactly what the conditions are that create the state. And you can basically go back into that at will with like absorptive concentration as a state-based practice. And I see Shinzen nodding his head. So I'm not saying anything completely stupid at this point, but the, the, the ability to be able to get that feedback is different than say somebody taking a psychedelic, which might be a very mind expanding experience. And somebody says, wow, that was crazy, but they don't know how to reproduce it themselves without the help of you know, some serotonin uh, effect, you know, where they're, they're affecting the, the serotonin levels or their specific serotonin receptors in their brain as, as with the case with psychedelics. So here I, I see feedback as a really good way to help people train effectively because they're getting that direct feedback from their own brain. And ideally they'd be doing that with a teacher who could help them make sense and give them some uh, some signposts and say, oh, try this, try this, try this, as compared to, you know, monkey monkeys typing on typewriters and eventually you'll get Shakespeare, but it's, <laughs> it's much faster if you teach the monkeys how to type, <laughs> for example. And so as humans, um, as, you know, as there, humans- uh, Their teacher has a name, it's called, his name is Darwin. Darwin. <laughs> right. right, yeah. Taught them, the, 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 not them, but someone like them back in the day. Yeah, and but and there I would say, you know, the the scale of evolution is a, a, also a little slow for for our lifetimes <laughs> given the global changes. Yeah. I we need to have an enzymes that, some enzymes to catalyze Darwin. Yes. yes, we we need to get moving, and, and I would that's say that's what we're talking about here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'll, I'll I'll just end that by in, and then hand it over to you, San Shinzen. I would say, th th well, I'm sorry, hand it I, over I to Jay. But actually, please complete your story. Yeah, I, I want to see where you see all the translation, like because now we opened it up. Okay, the issue so there is there's two. a global fucking crisis. Yeah, and so I'll we, mention have something to say. <laughs> yeah, the, the, so this, I'll, I'll just mention some phenomenologic work that we've been doing that is related to this in terms of there is hope, <laughs> I think, for humanity, which is looking at if you really want to distill this getting caught up in experience uh, versus letting go to very, very simple 
easily understandable markers that are probably universal. We've been playing, we did a study with several hundred people across, you know, basically English speaking. That was basically all, all we required people to do. And we wanted to see, you know, is there a, do people understand the universal language of open and closed or expanded or contracted basically? And so we basically didn't give people definitions of what this was. We just said, hey, if you feel anxious and you had to pick, does it feel closed or does it feel open? If you feel frustrated, if you had to pick, does it feel closed or does it feel open? If you feel connected, if you had to pick, does it feel closed or open? And we found that nearly universally, uh, you know, with very high level of, of, um, of agreement, people reported things like anxiety and frustration, anger as closed down experiences because we feel closed, we feel contracted when we're frustrated, when we're, when we're anxious. And, the, and you, we could even link this back, you know, fear is one that makes people feel closed. If you think of this from an evolutionary perspective, when you're being chased by the proverbial sa saber tooth tiger, your job is to become as small a target as possible so you can protect your vital organs. So there may be even be an, you know, an evolutionary uh, piece to this where you know, fear helpful for survival, anxiety probably not so much, but it's an offshoot. Think of anxiety as fear of the future. You know, so we're we're thinking about what it might be like <laughs> to get eaten by the saber tooth tiger in the future. There we're not in immediate danger, and the reason I mentioned that open and closed piece is that we also did another experiment where we just asked, "Hey, is there is there a, a universal reward hierarchy in people's brains where they prefer certain states to other states?" And you know, we've my lab's done a bunch of work with. Um, you know, with reinforcement learning, and, and, uh, which I won't go into, but what we looked at was, you know, if do people prefer, would they prefer, you know, and this might sound obvious when I say it, but we had to do the experiment, you know, does it feel better to be anxious or does it feel better to be curious? You know, it's a no brainer. Uh, curiosity feels better than anxiety. And when we linked up those, those, uh, those states, it was the open states that all felt much more rewarding than the closed state. So there seems to be, the way we interpreted that is that there is a natural reward hierarchy in our brain that says, hey, you know, when given a choice between anxiety and curiosity, you know, please pass the curiosity. I'll have some of that, please. And the other nice thing about this, where I say there is hope is that feeling connected is more rewarding in this reward hierarchy than feeling disconnected. You know, being kind is more rewarding than anger. So here we're starting to see the modern science line up with the ancient Buddhist psychology around, you know, <laughs> anger begets anger. You know, if you look at the Dhammapada, you know, they, they talk about how, you know, you can only cure, you know, anger can only be solved with love. And if you look at that from just a basic reward valuation standpoint, love feels better than anger. Connection feels better than disconnection. And so, you know, when, when we, are given a choice between, hey, we're all in this together, let's do this, as compared to every person for themselves, you know, go, you know, duke it out for survival of the fittest. Uh, the good news is, in general, the, when, especially when given a choice, when we can see the, what it feels like to be open versus closed, I, I think humans are going to opt toward connection, kindness, openness, uh, curiosity, as compared to, you know, being fixed in a certain way and, and trying to force things. So here, you know, what we're looking to do, looking down the road, is what I'd love to do is be able to simplify the feedback language. And Shinzen, you and I have had conversations offline about this. But, you know, what's the simplest language we can use that everybody, as many people as possible, are going to understand without us having to explain because that's a critical piece. We can try to explain something to somebody and think, oh yeah, I hope they got it as compared to not explaining it if they know it from their own experience. If we can give them experiential markers that we can then incorporate into the feedback, right? And we can even, you can think of it as tearing the scale, you know, where you set the scale at zero, where you say, okay, anxiety, frustration, you know, blah, blah, blah you know, help, help people kind of tear this scale there at closed states. And then what does curiosity feel like? Like feel into curiosity, feel into connection, feel into kindness. 
so they can start to tear the scale into open states. That can then even help make sure that they get places to start when it comes to feedback, for example, from the posterior cingulate. Because we, what, what we need to do next is directly line up those phenomenological accounts of open and closed with the, with the uh, posterior cingulate activity. We've in some part done that with some of our earlier studies, but we didn't explicitly do that with open and closed. So I wanna simplify some of our earlier experiments and show that that is actually true with open and closed states because then, and also this will fit, I think, with what you all are doing, if we can if we can simplify that language we can use that language as signposts for people then we can have them use that as feedback from their own direct experience as a way to start working with some of these tools whether it's eeg neurofeedback that's source estimated from the posterior cingulate or even you know the the type of work that you all are doing but i'll just mention in case you know in case somebody's um, stops listening right now any of us <laughs> Without the use of these fancy tools, any of us can look at our own experience right now and, you know, go back to the Buddhist psychology where they said cause and effect. That's critical for learning. That's what karma is. Look to see when you yell at somebody, do they do they look closed or open? Do you feel open or closed? And how does that decrease suffering in the world? You know, and then when you're kind to somebody including yourself, do you feel closed or open? So we, we actually, and when you're curious versus when you're anxious, you know, we, we've used this with our Unwinding Anxiety app where we've gotten huge effects. We got a 67% reduction in people with generalized anxiety disorder, basically teaching this thing. So, and Shinsen, I'm sure you've gotten effects like this. People can calibrate their own experience right now without, um, you know, a big neurofeedback device or without psychedelics. Certainly these things can help. But I think any of us can be doing this starting right now. And in my opinion, in order to, I don't, I don't want to sound dramatic, but in order to save the planet, uh, we really do all need to be doing this. And I say that because if we can start to see how much we are just fighting against ourselves and each other, and that this is actually just keeping us stuck in local minima where we think, oh, this is, you know, tribalism, that's the way to go. And we can't just see over the edge where we're like, oh, wow. When we're all in, when we all work together, wow, it feels better and we do better. That's where we've got to get out of is these local minima. And we've got to really get into the, the global minima where it's like, what's the best for all of us? And, and that that smacks, that, that's, that smells kind of like non-duality. So over to you, Shinzen. It smells like engineering human evolution for happiness. Um, <laughs> I'll drink to that. I, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to make one meta comment, M-E-T-A, not yet M-E-T-T-A. <laughs> and, uh, then we are going to turn it over to Jay. The meta comment is, uh, Guru Viking, you just struck the mother load because... Jay and I know where this is going, and I think Judd may have some idea also, and Chelsea is losing her shit laughing. <laughs> uh, people are going to get to see, we're going to have Judd back if it's okay with him. I'm not going to do an assumptive close, but people are going to get to actually see some sausage being made here. Because these two research programs are very linked, but we haven't had a chance to talk for a while. And I am going to have to say, I'm going to have to replay this video. Listen carefully to what Judd said just so far, taking copious notes, which I'm trying to do now, but it's too much. Jay's probably having the same thought, oh my God, are there things we need to be talking about back and forth, given what you've said? So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing some good A-roll <laughs> here, uh, Steve. <laughs> Feel happy. Um, and to anyone that's going, 
that's drinking from a fire hose and there's going to be more. It, what, what Jed just did, Jay is going to do just as dense. But don't freak out. <laughs> you can listen again. <laughs> and uh, we're going to unpack this however long it takes. So this is, this is the bomb. This is the bomb, and if I can make my own meta commentary, I personally, if I could state a desire, Judd, I would love to hear you be completely dramatic and wildly dream, be and have yes, all of agreed. us speak as though we don't mind for people to drink from a fire hose, because I think maybe if there is a saved world, it comes from brilliant people like you dreaming wildly and being dramatic about saving the world. Not, that's my personal request. Even more than I just have. <laughs> as, mu as much as you do in your secret dreams. That, that's my personal desire is to hear your, your let's, wildest let's hopes. Let's give Jay's secret dreams at least a few minutes. Yeah, we can no. circle back to even wilder Not Jay, uh, Judd, sorry. Oh. I'm getting my... Let's give Judd's uh, dreams... I got Wait, my J's a, mixed up. That's so, a compliment if you think I'm Judd. So, thank you for that. <laughs> so I'll say one other thing because I also am I'm dying to hear what Jay has to say. You know, my wildest dream would be to help people see so clearly just how painful it is to harm other people and how clearly for them to see just so clearly how good it feels to help other people and themselves. I mean, it's, we're, we're all in this together. If people could just see how painful it is to harm others, like if there was a way to inject that into their brains where, where it's like, look what you just did now, pay attention. Don't turn away. Don't go, don't hurt people on social media where you don't have to see their reactions, really pay attention face to face. What did that feel like? And we'll, if, given a choice, would you choose kindness? Um, I think that's going to help people look over that edge of the local minima that we're probably in globally right now, where, you know, the, the harm and the, the outrage and the, basically the ego, ego, ego just tastes yummy to a lot of people because they've not tasted the greater taste of the freedom that comes from egolessness and kindness and connection. So here, I think, and one of my hopeful speculations is that with a combination of the technology that you are building, which can help people, it, you, you know, the, the psychedelic experience can be great, but I think it can be really challenging for people to interpret and actualize on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. So here, we need to have this stuff be actionable and actualizable, and feedback is best way that people learn, but also giving people a nudge. Like, could you all take the, the ultrasound and shove people over that edge of that, that energy barrier that, that we all have where we're not willing to look to see, you know, what it tastes like, you know, where it, that, that pull, the siren song of kindness, of connectedness is so strong that people can't imagine anything else. When that, that call is so strong, then we'll be okay because everybody will stop what they're doing to, to hoard and to cheat and to beat each other up. And they will stop doing that because they'll see how trivial and how painful it is and how harmful it is for not just others, but themselves, because they, you know, when you're really greedy, you can, you can just focus on the greed and not focus on how painful it is and not focus on like how you have to keep getting more and it's not actually satisfying. But here, if we can really help them see that, and I, I'm hoping that, that these technologies can help people do that, that's where we can engineer that next evolution that Shenzhen's talking about. And it will, and I say, it's there. It's already in our DNA. So it's not that we even have to engineer it. It's the, just that we have to help people see that they've already got it. And the engineering piece is to help them see clearly, which comes back to, you know, what's that term? Vipassana, seeing clearly, right? <laughs> if we can see clearly 
to our brains, it's a no brainer. So that's my wild dream is how can we help people see clearly and how can we help engineer the feedback that helps them the most people see most clearly, most quickly. I, I will stop there, please. Jay, beautiful. take it away. That was beautiful. Thank you so much for that. Um, I feel like there's a lot of buildup now. I think we should just leave it there. That's that's exactly what we're working <laughs> yeah, that, on. So. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's it. That's it, folks. Now we just need 15 years to 20 years of research. And yep. Um, I, I did want to say, Steve, I think Judd's papers are so beautiful and so accessible. I wanted to make a plug, and I think a lot of your listeners and viewers may want to look at them. Will we have a place to post to them, or should we say the citations here? Certainly. Okay. Certainly. Yeah. Any, anything that's brought up here, I'll, I'll put in the show notes, and uh, I can also put um, you know, a link to ResearchGate and all these things. I'll, I'll, I'll link all the papers below. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, yeah, well, thank you, Judd, for the beautiful overview. I wish I would have had that about five years ago when I started out here, because <laughs> I think you've taken us through to where we are now. And it's, I mean, to me as a researcher in the field, it's such an exciting time. And it, you know, talking about looking for hope, which I think we need some of that um, in these times. Uh, some of your research and some of the things that people in the field are working on like you are really giving me hope for bringing some of these practices to the people. So thank you. Um, so where does our story start? Well, we've talked to quite a bit about this. So some of the other listeners have heard, so I'll, I'll give the abridged version so we can dig in. Uh, but it starts in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, I was actually working with the Department of Defense and Vince Clark who is a very well-known uh, non-invasive brain stimulator. So he uses different types of tools to uh, very gently and very safely modulate brain activity. So you can do things like facilitate learning. One of the things that Vince had found is that by using a little bit of direct current over the right prefrontal cortex, you can double the rate of learning on a certain task. And so when I came into the postdoc, one of the questions was, can we use this non-invasive brain stimulation technology to facilitate mindfulness training? Now, it's not to replace mindfulness, but it was to help people learn mindfulness skills uh, while they're training in, in mindfulness uh, practice. And so for the first couple of months, I really steeped myself in the field. I fell in love with Judd and Judd's research very quickly. Um, some of the neurofeedback work that he was describing, I just loved it. And so we started sampling all the different types of technologies that we might be able to use to help facilitate mindfulness training. Um, and now some people might be asking, well, why would you want to do that? Well, we were looking at the research out of Judd's lab and other labs that was showing that mindfulness in the clinic can have pretty large clinical benefit for patients like chronic pain patients. Uh, but there's often a barrier. So if you have chronic pain, it's often hard to sit on the pillow for 30 minutes, focus inward and focus on your pain. It can actually increase the pain signal. Um, and they, they, you can get something called the backdraft effect where it actually makes the pain worse. And so we started looking at some of these neurotechnologies and asking, well, if we could give people some of the benefit of mindfulness training in the clinic, quicker, we get them to those benefits quicker, quicker and they get um, some of that relief. And so we started looking around and uh, one of my colleagues uh, showed me an article by Shenzhen called TDCS is my girlfriend. So your listeners might want to look that up. Actually, I think the title was uh, something like TDCS, my new girlfriend. My new girlfriend, right? Or me? Poor, yeah. yeah. Like whoever is Shinzen's new mathematical girlfriend, I always feel bad for them because you know he really loves hard, and then he just changes. You know, a couple months later, TDCR is out. Category theory is in. Here we go. Category theory is staying, it's, I think, for a while. They're category married. Category theory <laughs> is my new girlfriend, and Judd. Oh my God, we have not talked about this at all. It's you probably haven't even heard the term. You're teasing Apply me. You're, you're teasing me. <laughs> Applied category theory. We yeah. will talk about this, but that's where that's where it all goes. That's my new girlfriend, and she's a keeper, <laughs> and she is just the hottest date in town <laughs> for for people that want to save the world. 
She's polyamorous. Polynomial <laughs> functors. Poly is her name. Uh, these are high-level math jokes here, by the way. <laughs> so, you know, pre uh, pre polyamory category theory. Uh, yeah, I, I found Shenzhen's work on essentially using brain stimulation to facilitate mindfulness, and uh, reached out to Shenzhen, and we started talking about this technique that I had been researching. Lots of other researchers have been looking into actually using sound, so ultrasound, high frequency sound, to focus into the brain to stimulate very particular brain networks. And in talking to Shenzhen back in 2017, uh, we had about a five hour conversation <laughs> one day in Albuquerque. And we started thinking, you know, wouldn't it be neat to target some of these networks that people like Judd Brewer have been publishing on, like the posterior cingulate and the default mode network, to try to boost something like equanimity. So this openness to experience that Judd was talking about. What if we could temporarily boost that in a safe way while people are trying to learn some of these mindfulness skills? Would it help them zoom into the practice? Would it allow some of the skills to stick, to stay so they could learn and bring them into the world and get to some of the benefit that Judd was describing? And uh, so Shenzhen and I, um, you know, we, we, I think that day on the phone, we gave it a one in a million chance of working. Yeah. And uh, we thought, all right, this will be something fun to do on the weekend, pilot studies, you know, for fun. Uh, and, you know, it'll be a kind of a fun thing that we'll talk about in five years that we tried and failed. And Shenzhen flew out to Albuquerque and had decided to stay for one week, I believe it was. He, he had a return flight. And uh, then about three or four weeks passed, we kept experimenting and Shenzhen kept pushing back his flight. And, you know, that probability went from one in a million to one in 10,000 to one in a thousand. And it just kept working. Every part of the brain where we, we ultrasounded or the term is sonicated uh, on Shenzhen and on a couple other long-term meditators, we started getting these reports of deepening of equanimity, of deepening of concentration. Some meditators uh, were experiencing deep states, absorb, absorbed states of meditation that felt like they were on retreat for a few days. And uh, we just got super excited at this point, uh, thinking, all right, do we have something here? And um, we started you know, doing more formal experiments there in Albuquerque to try to figure out, is this real? Is this a placebo effect? You know, so we double blinded and placebo controlled and really started asking the question, you know, if this is possible, if we can focus non-invasive energy into the brain, if we can modulate these brain circuits and help people get into these deep meditative states so it helps their practice, which brain regions should we target? Um, and as I said, I started really falling in love with Judd's work uh, and really started seeing something there with that posterior cingulate target that Judd was talking about. And uh, so we really started uh, focusing on that as we, uh, we decamped. Once I finished my postdoc, um, we moved to Tucson. And um, we really started trying to plan out careful scientific paradigms where we could target those regions that Judd was talking about. And then really ask the question, what are the types of phenomenological or subjective effects that people are getting? And how useful is this for meditation training, for mindfulness training? And then the bigger question, which we can get to, is really the, the, the place that Judd brought it was, if this works, how do we make sure it works in the world? How do we even quantify that? And how do we make sure that we take the feedback from the users and from the people around the users to make sure that that's actually getting them to the places that Judd was describing uh, and not to the places that you might want to write like a Black Mirror episode or some scary sci-fi future that you can also imagine, which is, is possible to be honest with this technology. Um, so I'll leave it there. Shenzhen uh, was the first pa patient, so patient zero to go through this. So maybe we can <laughs> pick up the story with him. Uh, I, actually, I'd like you to give Judd more uh, science details about our work. Sure, happy to. 
Um, so the first place we started, Judd, and I think we talked about this last time, was the basal ganglia, which I know you're also quite interested in because of habit formation. And when Shenzhen and I first started talking about this, the real question was, what's the big effect? You know, what are we really trying to do in terms of modulating the brain? And we wanted to have as much clarity as possible because uh, the honest truth is we don't know much about how the brain works. And now we're talking about modulating it with technology. And, you know, part of this is learning. So everything we're doing in our lab is modulating the brain to learn how it functions. But we very quickly want to pivot to translation to help people learn mindfulness to get to those types of effects that you were talking about. And so uh, the first place we thought was, well, if we could uh, temporarily disrupt the habit system, we might help people disrupt the habits that are harming them or getting in the way of mindfulness training. Um, so thinking about something like smoking, you talked about that previously. Um, mindfulness practice works well. You, even, you have an app that actually helps people. And so we thought, you know, if you could disrupt some of that craving behavior, you might actually help the person sit on the pillow longer. You could help them get uh, unhook that uh, habit, for example. And so uh, in the first studies, we looked at this disorder called athymhormia, um, which is an extreme disorder of motivation or habit disruption. And uh, we targeted the, caudate, the head of the caudate nucleus bilaterally and essentially found that in long-term meditators, we could deepen their sense of equanimity to almost an extreme degree in some cases. Jay, and, Jay can I uh, jump in for a second? Sure. Um, we delivered what we thought would be an a an interfering or a down regulating or a create a challenge uh, form of stimulation on the uh, the head of the caudate uh, nucleus. Is that correct? Is my memory correct? I, I just wanted to clarify that for people listening because we're talking yeah. about using these modalities, electricity, ultrasound, and so forth, uh, and neurofeedback. Um, but with the modalities, it's important to understand that depending on the where and the when and the patterning of the energy, mm -hmm. you may be talking about upregulating, downregulating, connecting, disrupting, facilitating, challenging, and those can be in useful ways or not very good ways. So there's a, a lot of dimensions to the parameter space. I just wanted to jump in and clarify what our, you, you mentioned the location, uh, mm. part of the basal mm. ganglia based on hypothesis from athymhormia, uh, athymhormic syndrome. So okay. what kind of stimulation were we thinking we were doing? Yeah, that's a good question. So we're using uh, focused ultrasound neuromodulation. So this is the ultrasound that we've described previously. And the thing about ultrasound is it tends to be easier to disrupt or inhibit brain activity. Uh, so again, we're talking temporarily, we're talking about for seconds to minutes, we're not doing any damage or anything like that, of course. Um, but with the ultrasound devices that we had back in 2017, 2018, it was much easier to um, make the brain region less likely to fire or disrupt its activity for a couple minutes. Um, and that's quite interesting. If you think back to something Judd was saying earlier about um, the, uh, what, what the PCC is doing and what, what you tend to see in some of these long-term practitioners, they were looking for, in the, in the MRI, they were looking for activation and all of these things and they weren't finding it. And then they started looking for deactivation. And uh, you know that actually sort of really linked with the early conversations that Shen, Shenzhen and I were having about what do we really want to do to the brain? If we could really advance meditation practice quickly and safely, you know, would we want to stimulate, you know, the attention areas or would we want to disrupt the sense of self or, you know, where, where, where would we go to make this safe and quick? And we always came back to this notion, or at least Shenzhen did, 
of being able to disrupt or remove certain things that are getting in the way of the practice would probably be the most effective path. And it just turns out that ultrasound seems to be a good tool for that because you could focus it to deep parts of the brain and you can temporarily disrupt those brain areas. And so that's what we were doing. And if I could just add something from a theoretical standpoint, just hearing this kind of live, um, this image comes up, it's kind of like, you know, if you want to start a fire, um, you, you need to get the kindling going, but then if there's enough fuel for the fire, it'll naturally burn on its own. So I could see the analogy being here, the ultrasound could be that kindling where you get the fire going. And then with skillful instruction, you help people see how great equanimity tastes. Yes. And then the fire just burns on its own. So just theoretically yep. speaking, I, I love the way you're thinking about this. That is awesome. I'm going to steal and, that. Uh, okay. Yeah. And that completely <laughs> aligns. Uh, furthermore, it aligns with the underlying logic of Buddhism, core logic of the historical Buddha, or at least of very early Buddhism. Um, if we give it a fairly broad interpretation, and the it is the Four Noble Truths, this is core. All Buddhist traditions talk about this. And when you analyze it logically, it's four things. And you have to think a little bit broadly, a little broader than you would normally think, a little bit wider view. What are these four things in this wide view? OK, there is, quote, suffering, meaning in this case, if there's anything in your sensory experience, um, or in the world that you're responsible for, that's a problem. Um, we're going to call that suffering. And all of the above has a single necessary cause. Now, Judd was sort of talking about getting this vocabulary where it's connected versus disconnected. So all you have to do is connect, which by the way is what category theory is about. It's called a functor, not going there. All you need to do is connect, um, but connect broadly and deeply and at scale. Yeah, that's, it, so there's disconnect, let's call it suffering or dukkha or a problem. <laughs> there's disconnect um, and there's the cause of disconnect. Um, disconnect has a necessary cause. Now, so there's suffering, that's dukkha, and there's the necessary cause of suffering, samudaya. Now, samudaya in Sanskrit or Pali means origin, but here it means necessary cause, what we would, and then the, there's problems with cause in logic. We won't go into that. Let's, we're speaking loosely now. <laughs> As a loosely speaking, necessary cause. There is a sufficient intervention called the path. That's the third noble truth, marga, magga. What that means is do this and it eliminates the thing that is needed for the suffering. So in your language, disconnect, if we were to use that. Disconnect has a necessary cause. Eliminate the disconnect. There's a path to doing that. And connect is already there. Now, the way the Buddha put it, he called it dukkha uh, sa samudaya magga uh, uh, 
uh, and Nibbana, the connect that's always been there, he called Nirvana. I'm just translating the Four Noble Truths into Judd's shot at a universal language uh, for the modern world. I think you're following me, Judd, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, um, connection, disconnection, line up with open, open slash connection, close slash disconnection, or yeah, yeah, yeah so exactly. Um, we can use open, closed. I'm going to suggest you not use expand, contract, That's and fine. we can go. Yeah, uh, but I'm, actually, I'm going to explain why, but not okay. now. Okay. Um, okay. So. Um, That is, to me, that is very convenient for, the, for, for clinical science because there can be more than one necessary cause for things. Phenomenologically, from a first person point of view, the meditator says, I found the place of all craving and I released it, and all suffering now is gone. <laughs> um, that's, uh, uh, but there, so one question is, what's going on neurophysiologically when that happened? <laughs> that's, a, that's a question. Another question is, how does that relate to a condition like Athymhormic syndrome, which is pseudo arhatship? It's pathological version of being an arhat. They're in eternal mental quiet. They're in eternal, everything's fine. When, and they're able to function just fine if you activate a self from the outside by talking to them they will be normal for a minute or two, but if you don't keep activating the self, they go flat and they don't eat or move or think. That's pseudo arhat. How does that relate? And we know what that is because you could look at, and you don't even need an MRI, an X-ray, a doctor like you will know You've got lacunar infarct in a bad spot all over the place. First year medical student. We know what that pseudo arhat is. How does this all relate? Okay. What are the dimensions of the necessary causes for disconnect or closed? There may, so, the PCC looks like a good candidate for a necessary cause for that is something physiological that we can work on. But as Jay said, we started actually with the basal ganglia because of our interest in pseudo arhat. And now I'll, I just wanted to sort of jump in and turn it back to Jay now. Yeah, thanks for that. I'm so happy you got that out there because I don't think we've talked about that logic publicly. And that really, that was 2018 and the, the timeline here where Shenzhen and I started talking about that. And it took a couple conversations for Shenzhen to explain that to me. And once I got it, and once I realized that ultrasound may be a tool to approach what he's talking about. So some of that inhibition or removal of some of the habitual conditioning that's getting in the way of practice. That really was the pivot point where we started thinking, well, what other networks in the brain could we target to get at what Shenzhen just described? Uh, not fully, you know, we never, we never were grandiose enough to think that we could fully deliver someone to that place, but that would interact with the practice in a way that would facilitate the practice in the way Judd was describing. And uh, I started reading Judd's papers and fell in love with this paradigm that he described previously about the default mode network. And so uh, we did a pilot study in actually non-meditators. So I'd be interested to hear just feedback about this. Um, part of the, the advantage of ultrasound is that it's hyper-focused. So you can focus it 
to millimeters in the brain. It's very, very, very focal. That means you have to have an MRI. Um, you have to have the individual picture of that person's brain to actually guide the brain stimulation. And so uh, we did this little study on about seven participants where we took a picture of their brain. We used that picture to target the brain stimulation down to the PCC, and we attempted to inhibit uh, temporarily that PCC activation. And in five of the seven participants, so these people are not meditators, um, they don't have any meditation experience, and they weren't told that this is a meditation part of the brain, uh, they were just told we're inhibiting a part of your brain, we want you to report what it's like. Um, they reported what sounded like if, if you had an increase in equanimity and you didn't have a language for it yet. So they reported things like, my thoughts are less sticky, my thoughts are coming and going, uh, this feels nice. A lot of people were like, wow, I, you know, I just sat here and my thoughts went away and they came and they went away and yeah, yeah that feels good for some reason. <laughs> um, a couple people tasted what seemed like flow. So their sensory experience was flowing from visual to auditory to thought space and then back again. And a lot of people actually experienced their attention being external, meaning that if they were laying in the MRI, instead of being engaged in that inner monkey mind, they were just paying attention to a little dot on the screen that they were looking at, for example. And some people actually became absorbed in that stimulus. They actually sort of felt like they were merging <laughs> a little bit, uh, which was quite fascinating to us. Um, so that was our, our first experience there where we, you know, for just five minutes of inhibition of the posterior cingulate, already put people in a state that looked like the direction of increasing equanimity. Um, I don't know if you have any initial thoughts on that, Judd. <laughs> oh, one is it, it, it brings tears to my eyes because it's like, it's, you know, where the self is the glue and that gets us all mucked up in experience and causes suffering. Here's, here's a solvent, you know, that can help unstick that and help people in it. I like how you did it in an unbiased way is like report what you noticed, you yeah. know, literally get unstuck and they use the language to do it, which also suggests that the, you know, people can, can describe their experience in a way that doesn't need to be prompted. So I'd say it's, that is very encouraging to hear. Yeah, we were super encouraged. One anecdote was a, um, a young mom who had just had her second baby and uh, the baby was three months old. And, you know, so she was getting some space for the first time from, from her, her child, but she said she almost had tears in her eyes when she, you know, finished this intervention and she said, this is the first moment where I had some space. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, well, you know, maybe it's just because this is the first time you're away from your kid. And it's, you know, there's lots of joy in having a kid. There's also lots of sleep deprivation and all, all kinds of other things. And she said, no, no, no. Because normally, you know, if I have a little space from the kid, I'm thinking about them. And she said, the thought came and then it just burst. You know, she said kind of pop, disappeared. And she said it was in that disappearing where I was just free for a couple seconds. And that's when she kind of teared up. And we're, we're trying to be like non-emotional, right? As researchers, we don't want to give them feedback on what they're saying. And so I kind of had to leave the room. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> like, this is real. This is so cool. So yeah, that was the first study. We didn't give them any questionnaires or anything. We just asked them to report because we didn't want to prime them in any way. Um, but then, you know, after that experience, Shenzhen and I said, okay, now I think it's time to pivot uh, to this paradigm because this really seems interesting. And so uh, we decamped from Albuquerque. I, I finished my postdoc and Shenzhen and I set up a lab uh, called Sima Lab, Sonication Enhanced Mindful Awareness Lab. And uh, we got some funding and then the pandemic happened and that funding got frozen. <laughs> and then we got some new funding. And uh, we were one of the only labs during the pandemic that was actually allowed to run human studies. And this time we started ultrasounding the PCC in the MRI. Um, so this, this study was the next scientific step. So we had a placebo control, half the participants got real PCC inhibition, half of them got placebo. And now we're targeting with more precision. And the question was, do we get more uh, 
precise effects? And do we get more reliability when we're actually targeting inside the MRI? And then do we actually see the default mode network decreasing as we're inhibiting that network? That's the real question, because it's if that's really what's going on, that should predict these subjective reports. Uh, so we ran about 45 subjects, and in the people who got the PCC inhibition, uh, the mo majority of them reported these same types of effects. And now we're using questionnaires and all types of other things. And the typical report is more openness to experience. Um, they increased in state mindfulness. So we use some mindfulness scales, which are not great scales, and we can talk about those, but at least that's what we see on the scales. And most of them reported uh, time was shrunk. So they're in the MRI scanner, which is not a fun environment to be in. You're locked in there, you can't move, it's very confining. Most of them experienced 30 minutes as five to 10 minutes. So it was easier to be in this sort of confined space, uh, which is quite nice. And the, the really interesting, we haven't published this part yet, but the really interesting thing that um, if this gets through peer review, you'll get to see this, is that the subjects who had the biggest decrease in default mode network activation had the biggest subjective self-report. It's a, it's a correlation that is, seen, is tending to hold up. And that is really, really cool to see. Um, so I think, you know, that's the thing we'd really predict from some of Judd's work with the, um, with the neurofeedback, the fMRI neurofeedback. So uh, now we're replicating that again with a dose response study. So this will get in the weeds. We won't talk about this part. But now the question is, if we double the dose, do we double the subjective effect? Mm -hmm. And we're adding a task on top of it because the question is, uh, you know, the PCC is highly involved in lots of other things besides sense of self and some of these meditative experiences that we're talking about. And we're very cautious about modulating some of those other behaviors and abilities. And so we'll actually be looking at task behavior to make sure that they can perform tasks. We actually think they'll be better at external tasks. Um, so we're making that prediction. So quite, a, quite exciting. If I could just ask a question, because the, you know, the PCC in particular, I think of it as it's kind of like Manhattan, where there's not a lot of space, but there's a lot of buildings in there, yeah. as compared to like Houston or some, you know, some place where there's, there's a lot more space and you don't have to build as closely together. And so there have been some good studies parcelating the different networks involved, you know, connected to different facets of the PCC. Mm -hmm. And, you know, pretty nice, you know, functional connectivity parcellation work. So I'm curious, you know, are you using some of that to inform what particular aspect of the PCC you give uh, inhibition to? Because I think that could, you know, could certainly affect different networks, but it might also, it might also give insight, but also hone in on the subjective experience that you're talking about in terms of heightening the equanimity. Yeah, that's a great question. We have done that. Um, so we used your fMRI papers in the early studies to kind of find the piece of the PCC. Mm -hmm. And what we tended to find is that the posterior portion of the PCC gave more of this type of openness effect uh, relative to where the field would typically define the PCC, which is usually this left node kind of more central uh, in the PCC. That node actually uh, tended to be more disruptive on processing in general, cool. and subjects would report uh, a, a bit more maybe anxiety around the fact that they don't have control over their their ability and thought and things like that. Which, you know, which uh, I'm sorry, I, which, which subdivisions of the PCC are we talking about? I've so lost track. Yeah. If you're thinking about posterior and anterior, so the cingulate is this long structure that goes from the front. Right. To the back. But I think Judd was talking about subregions within the PCC itself. Is that correct? That's and right. using the uh, uh, precise targeting ability that the ultrasound gives us for getting differential anatomically, uh, you know, uh, just in the PCC itself. I think yes. that's what you were talking about. Did I get that right? So I was referring to like Rob Leach has done a lot of nice parcellation work and I'm sure you all are familiar with it. So for example, it's interesting that you say the more, did you say the more posterior aspects were? Yeah. 
Yeah. So if I remember correctly, the more posterior aspects line up with the classical, you know, at least the, um, the, the more classical default mode network hubs, like the medial prefrontal cortex and a little bit of the posterior parietal, whereas some of the more dorsal aspects look different. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it that what you're finding lines up a lot with, and also I think lines up with, um, yeah, I would say that that makes a lot of theoretical sense that that would that that would be the case just based on what what some of Leach's work is showing. Yeah, yeah, we've tried, and we're actually thinking if if we get some funding, we want to do a parcellation study. And one of the caveats for our tool, um, and this is getting in the weeds again, but the skull tends to open the beam, so we have this nice acoustic beam where we can target brain areas. The beam is about 10 millimeters long by maybe five millimeters thick. So it's this nice little pencil shape, uh, but the skull uh, distorts and aberrates the beam. And so until you do what's called aberration correction, you probably can't get as fine grained in these different yeah. pixelations, uh, parcellations as we want to get. Uh, we're working on that in our lab. So that's some of the funding that we're trying to get. And once we do, then we can really start asking some very interesting theoretical questions uh, that will tell us a lot about the DMN, the default mode network, but then also informs where we want to go, which is coupling this with meditation training. And, you know, my intuition on this is it's probably not the same spot for different people, which makes this a lot harder of a, a task. But the eventual goal would actually be to try to activate PCC while they're meditating. So maybe use like your neurofeedback paradigm use that as a targeting mechanism for the ultrasound and then ask the question, does that work better than using a general map, you know, across different subjects? And, but and, you can also with ultrasound go just direct first person. Who knows? It might not just be that it anatomically shifts uh, uh, or that it be, it's anatomically different, but it might shift around day to day. Uh, what affects them in a certain way. We don't know for sure, but the beauty of the ultrasound is you can take the first person and we, we can move the ultrasound millimeters in one direction or another and let them find their sweet spot uh, in that general area for them and maybe for them on that day, it can be done. They, they can calibrate their own uh, dosing in a sense. And no, Jay, no other neuromodulation modality allows for that kind of uh, that, I would say. Not, not with the precision that we're talking about. That, that we, uh, yeah. And also the other thing I wanted to say to judge just to emphasize when Jay says we're working on getting the beam focused, he means we're working on it seriously and we've got some hopes. Yeah. Oh, so that's great. Smile again. Yeah. So, <laughs> and one thing that I'm sure you're already thinking about is, you know, it's also important with the, with the first person subjective experience, you know, I could see, pros and cons to both going, you know, if you go too far in the subjective experience realm and have them direct it, uh, they may not know what to look for. And yep. so may not be able to say, yes, that's it. Because all, if they, all they've known is like craving as, or excitement as happiness, then that that can be problematic, but also not going too far in the, oh, we know exactly what it's going to be for you. And so we're not yep. going to listen to you. So I'm guessing tuning it somewhere in the middle where you give people some feedback, like, you know, where they're starting to say, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, it's not as sticky. And then saying, okay, let's go with what's the least sticky and moving it around a little bit to help anchor them in the experience that they might not have had much, but yep. also say, okay, that's what we're looking for. Let's tune that up. So you then to, zoom into their subjective experience as a way to, to hone that. Yep. To bring yeah. in an, uh, a, a biological evolutionary principle. I would think that, remember, as we always emphasize, uh, the ultrasound for us will always be linked to mindfulness training, systematic, mm -hmm. committed, actually, hopefully, eventually, mindfulness training. 
that's what we're doing. Uh, it's not ultrasound and we're zapping you to nirvana. It's we're facilitating the mindfulness training. So to bring in the biological principle, I would predict that as their mindfulness increases, their ability to detect the impact of the ultrasound increases. They co-evolve. Yep, that's totally. the biological principle. And at some point, we're, uh, we're just really literally hitting the spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Judd, you outlined the next our, our five year plan. So <laughs> you can just you can write that up for it. We'll submit it off. But that's that's exactly the next step. Is now we're combining it with mindfulness training for beginners. Um, and once we understand how that works, we're actually combining it with EEG uh, in real time um, as a way to try to close the loop. So you can actually tell the ultrasound to trigger based on what the brain is doing. That's called a closed loop system. Um, and so, you know, but it's not the, the part of the loop is subjective self-report and, and likely other objective measures that are all serving the purpose of, are they increasing their concentration ability, their equanimity? If it's compassion training, are we able to help them do that type of training? So there's always this bigger goal, which is the mindfulness training. And we have these sort of shells of, of measurement that are constantly feeding back into the central goal. And I'm a humanist at heart. So for me, the central goal is what's it like <laughs> for the person? Now I'm a scientist at heart as well. And I understand there's a lot of problems with asking people, what is it like? So we're constantly trying to fuse, you know, the sort of subjective reports with the objective data, with the brain stimulation, with the training. And, you know, that's the sort of those shells that I'm talking about is the sort of 20 year trajectory here. <laughs> well, just related to that, and we can talk offline more, but I could see, you know, one of the pragmatic aspects in this is my, you know, being in a school of public health is how can we shift health on a population level, which is why we've been doing a lot of work with digital therapeutics, you know, can we develop, you know, theory based mechanistically based apps that can help people learn. It'd be really fun to explore pairing that digital technology with your neurofeedback technology, as well as the ultrasound, as the sonication technology to see, you know, could we, could we use a systematic evidence-based mindfulness training that people can take home with them yep. uh, and have certain, you know, certain doses of, of sonication and potentially even EEG neurofeedback uh, that could help them. So that would be really, you know, we can certainly explore that together. But I think, I think we may all be at a good place to do that. Literally this week, we are having our first large R or larger RCT published where we got, you know, sure. number needed to treat for generalized anxiety disorder is 1.6, whereas with medications, it's 5.2, meaning, you know, where wow. typically I would have to prescribe five people medication and one of them shows a benefit with this digital therapeutic, that number reduces to 1.6. And so it'd be interesting to see how we could even augment that more with the training and the sonication that you're doing. I think that would be really, really interesting, especially with things like generalized anxiety disorder, where some people like literally they're feeling anxious all day. And so yeah. can we disrupt that cycle quickly and help them taste what equanimity is like. So then they just take off from there and, and yep. the app gives them the handholds to do that, you know, so yep. something, something to explore for sure. Yeah. I love it. I have a colleague, Taylor Kuhn at UCLA who targeted the amygdala non-invasively and, and generalized anxiety patients and got, I think 86% of the patients had remission for some amount of time. I can't remember. I think it was a week or two weeks. But, you know, the reports from these studies are they get to taste exactly what you're saying, just some freedom from these experiences for amount of time that opens a window, in this case, for psychotherapy. You know, for us, it could be psychotherapy plus mindfulness based intervention. And that stuff is so exciting when you get to it because it's it's drug free intervention coupled with training, you know, so you're, you're getting them on the track to a, a new habitual pattern. And uh, that's that's so exciting. Yeah, the other to put in uh, uh -huh. just one uh, thing about Judd, when you talked about thinking about feedback broadly, remember that the mindfulness that they're going to get is uh, is my system. 
the one based on, uh, uh, hold it just a second. Uh, it's the one based that has all the flow charts, interactive yeah. guided practice that you're very yeah. familiar with. Many, so they're going to be getting the best guidance that I can come up with yeah. in terms of flow charting. And that's feedback, right? Yeah. And then is. we add these other feedbacks, and then we add a little booster on top. Now I think we have solved half of the problem. Hold it just a second. Sorry. Somebody really wants to get. Hi, I'm I'm on a call. I'll call you back <laughs> later. The whole world is listening. <laughs> <laughs> Not right now, but eventually. Um, okay. So uh, I think we could say that we've solved half the problem uh, if we can scale it out. The half of the problem is bringing a person into a state of oneness, call it what you want, no self, stunning equanimity, connectedness, um, we could probably sort of do that in a pretty controlled way. Mm -hmm. I would have not thought that possible in my lifetime when I had the idea of, as a young person of doing what we're talking about doing. Now, when I see what's out there, yeah, I think we, we can sort of have a controlled near death kind of thing here, not to shock people with that phrase, but that sort of is what we're talking about. But that's half the picture. And it's actually, in a sense, also none of the picture. Because if that half isn't met with a, another half, it equals zero. You just, it's just an altered state. You got high or you got scared but you just had an altered state. Yeah. Uh, even if it was an ego dissolution and the greatest thing that ever happened, and then it passed, uh, you just had an altered state. Yeah. The other half that makes it a whole, and in other words, what takes altered state as a zero, meaning it really doesn't mean that much, and makes it into one half, is what I would call integration. How are these experiences related to living a fulfilled and effective, an effective embodied life? Mm -hmm. If we can use everything we know about communication, psychology, all the clinical tools that we know that are uh, good, <laughs> good directions for living your life, if we can incorporate that, then we are, we're doing something that is biological. Yeah. You break down muscle exercising, but you do it in a careful way. You don't tear, it's micro. Then you also rest in between, you have diet, you use the whirlpool, whatever. Um, but that's just that breaking down and then nurturing. That just gives nature a chance to do what it already knows how to do, which is build better muscle. So we're building happiness muscle, basically, for, for humanity. And part of it, the, half of it is how do we in a not in a, a non-damaging way stress the system so that it breaks in a sense but it doesn't break down it breaks up and then it evolves from there by natural principles yeah. so now yeah. i see we can we we can in a controlled way probably break it down if we can, in a controlled way, build it up and integrate it, 
And then if we can make that available 24-7 to everyone in the world, it will set up an evolutionary force that in the long term, on average, Carl Friston would say, will lead to human happiness. Mm So, so just to, this gets me really, uh, I guess I'll use the word excited. Um, the, we, as a clinician, I've been exploring that realm with helping people do the integration piece in terms of the, the open, let's say openness. Uh, and we've, we've already started to see some, some effects. So for example, helping people, you know, I've been struck by the, you know, the, the summary of the sutta, the many suttas where the Buddha talks about exploring gratification to its end. You know, he says it wasn't until I explored gratification to its end that knowledge and vision arose. And so here we can look at that two ways. One is to see how painful it is to have an ego, for example, just to speak very, very broadly, but pragmatically, We did studies with people who were overeating. So just help them see very clearly how painful it is to overeat, but also help them and help them hone in on that. We used the the, um, concept of how content do you feel? We had to really pilot test this to find the right language for them to have the right feedback. How content do you feel when you overeat versus how content do you feel when you don't overeat? And it only took them 10 to 15 times I'm going to repeat that because this was blew my mind 10 to 15 times of people paying attention to shift the reward value in their brain. We could use these Rescorla Wagner models and show that that reward value drops below zero in 10 to 15 times of paying attention to how not content they feel when they overeat versus how content they feel when they don't. And so I would suggest that there we can be training people in using what you're talking about, these, these neuroscientific principles to see like, okay, what is more rewarding? How can we help bring the language in that helps people integrate these experiences that you are, you know, that you're helping to induce? How can they integrate those as quickly as possible? So that would be something that would be really fun to explore is like, how can we bring all of these things together? Well, what I'm hearing, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm getting the impression you've spent a lot of time finding a a balanced universal language for these contemplative notions. Am, Am I correct? Like, because you found the magic word contentment, you found the magic word open or connected that corresponds well uh, for the person in the street to these rather refined philosophical concepts from Buddhism. It looks to me like you've put a lot of effort uh, over these last few years in that direction. Yes. Yeah, I would say, you know, no, uh, no dig to philosophers. Philosophy hasn't solved cancer. You know, it doesn't cure cancer. And so philosophy can help point us in the direction. You know, I think these Buddhist concepts like exploring gratification to its end. Oh, that's a nice concept that has to be explored in one's own experience. And so here we have spent a lot of time of how, like you put it, how can we test that on the street without the need to explain concepts? Then we know it's something that'll actually be pragmatically Ah, useful from a clinical perspective. I was waiting for that. That's the segue. Yeah, Uh, that you just gave me the segue into the line I was waiting to use. Do it. (laughs) Uh Oh, do you have two more hours, Judd? (laughs) No, (laughs) you said it was one line. (laughs) I'm going to say, wait, how long have we been talking? We've been. What is it? Uh, Almost two hours. Yeah, it's getting close. We're getting close. I'm not saying we end at this point, but uh, I was just waiting for you to set it up for me, to tee it up. Thank you for teeing it up. Everything you just said, what was that phrase? Bring it down into the language of the street or what was yeah, the phrase? Onto the street. It's got to work on the street. the street. Onto the street. I'm writing it down. <laughs> 
how do we bring the, I'm going to say, down to the language of the street? Fair. Now, the language of the street is what one of the founders of science um, called the, uh, it was one of the idols. Uh, uh, remember Francis Bacon? He had the idols of the marketplace, right? That the language of the street, he said, is what gets in the way of science because people have these imprecise ways of talking mm. down in the street. And he called that the idols of the street. That's a nod to England, Steve. <laughs> this is, you could be proud <laughs> of, a, of that U, part of UK that produced Francis, Sir Francis Bacon. Um, so uh, there, but then he said, what was it? It was the idols of the theater, I think, was his term for philosophy run amok where mm. you could just say anything the fuck you want as a philosopher and call it something that if someone will pay you to do it, you, now you're a philosopher, you know? So, but there's also the result of human refined thought. Mm. And that's called the academy. That's mm. where we all work. Um, and broadly, that's the language of philosophy in the sense of the language of people that have thought deeply and carefully and precisely about things. So how do you bring the language of, the, of humanity's refined, most refined thinkers in all fields to the language of the street would be quite a... Um, a connection coup to pull that off, mm -hmm. particularly if it was in the service of saving our ass. Um, what you've been doing is a part of the picture that I've been thinking about but pursued in a different way from you. Hmm. That's why I'm taking notes. Because a lot of the things you said, this universalizing of the vocabulary, it's like I'm going, I probably would have eventually thought of that, but maybe not. And way down the line. So, oh, this is great. This is great. Mm. But I've been thinking similarly, but differently about the same problem. And it complements what you've been doing. So that's why there's more to talk. And all of this is um, apropos of this, this really big thing of connecting how the most refined humans have thought about things, who have had the time and whatever, the smarts, the circumstances, and the language of the street. On the, yeah, on the street. The language of the street, though, is the language of this monitor. The language of the street is what you're getting from those social media feeds and the, uh, creating the echo chambers uh, and, and the hate foundries. Um, so that's now the language of the streets. Mm -hmm. But there's also a lot of good stuff on there. Mm -hmm. We're on there, <laughs> for example. Um, anyone can reach us. We're not going to be blocked in any country that I'm aware of for what we're doing here. So that's the good part of that. Anyway, this big, to understand this really big connectivity and how it relates to feedback and how it might be scaled out to actually have an evolutionary effect. For that, um, 
I want you to meet my new girlfriend, Polly. <laughs> Applied category theory, polynomial functures. That's the new math, I think, for this work. So I'm wondering if that should be a cliffhanger for a next episode for us to geek out about, because I don't want to give it short shrift. And I also realized we haven't had much of a chance to really have an, you know, all of us have open conversation. We've just kind of started to scratch the surface and I would love, you know, I'd, I'd love to talk more about it, but not in a rushed way. I think we're I all a, in agreement. I have a small piece of meta commentary. If, if it would be helpful. And that will be, Please. yeah, that'll cap it. It's actually striking to me, listening to all of you, how some of the different things that have come up are so similar. So when you talk about language, one of the really beautiful ways that you put it, Judd, in the beginning of this episode was walking into someone's experience with language with them. And then what you are talking about now, Shinzen, about the meeting of the refined and the street level of language. There's a way in which if we were to give people language derived from our own minds and our own traditions, we would in some ways be superimposing a structure onto their reality and it could become aspirational for them rather than embedded within them. And there's something very similar going on in the way you're talking about neuromodulation. Not, we're not only telling them what they should be feeling, but rather searching within them for what they feel in their experience and neither preferencing completely their own experience nor the experience of the researcher or a teacher, but using both of them to, to modulate our language, our expressions, and in fact, our, our, the state of our brain together in a shared experience of searching. And so when you talk about bringing kindness to the world, for me, listening to this conversation is not just about making that happen, but is about doing science in a kind way. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean the real version of human empathy, where we mirror, reflect, and use that shared sense of self through language and through similar states to, to collectively modulate ourselves towards greater love and openness together. Um, and I just am so incredibly awestruck by that this is happening uh, in front of my eyes on so many different levels. Um, because that shared communion and willingness to be with someone deeply and know them in their own language and yours uh, is a very, very hopeful thing for me. So uh, thank you. That was well very said. well said. <laughs> yes. If there's a trailer for all of these episodes, that should be it right there. <laughs> <laughs> that was beautiful. Yeah. Shenzhen Yang. Chelsea Fasano, Dr. Jane Sanguinetti, and Dr. Judd Brewer. Thank you very much. Thank you. There we have it. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com. <laughs>